Chapter 2 When we get back to the car, my brother and sister are already in the back seat. Paul's nose is nestled in a book, and Gwen's eyes are closed as she bops her head, listening to music on her headphones. Mom stands beside the car, tapping her foot, arms crossed and lips stretched in a tight line. Everyone's already on their way to the restaurant, she says to Dad, her voice in an angry staccato. Turning to me, she gives my wet skirt a disapproving glance. Kate, get a towel from the trunk to sit on. I don't want you making a mess of the car. Get the mud off your shoes. Dad throws Mom a look, and when I go around to the back of the car to get a towel, she follows me. She tries to smile, but it doesn't come even close to reaching her eyes, and I can see the irritation sparkling from her bright green irises. This is hard for all of us, Kate. It'll get easier as time goes on. She says the words like she's trying to convince herself that they're true. I want to say, oh, yeah? Is that why you're such a wreck? It gets easier? That's why you don't hang out with me anymore? Ask me about my day? Or try and find out if I like any of the guys at school? Because it gets easier? Fact is, I'm not buying it. When Grandma died, it opened up a big hole in me. And even though a year's passed, that hole has not gotten any smaller. It's clear that Mom's hasn't gotten any smaller either. In fact, I think it's gotten bigger. But I just try and smile back at her, my lips quivering with the attempt. I try and make the right thing come out. Something simple like, Yeah, Mom, I know, it'll be fine but the words get struck in my throat. She turns on her heel and heads for the passenger seat. I stare at the back of her head, wishing I could have my old mom back. As we drive to the restaurant, Dad tries to strike up conversation to relieve the uncomfortable silence. But Gwen's listening to her music, Paul's absorbed in his book, and Mom and I both look out of our windows, barely responding. Finally, Dan turns the radio up and settles for humming along. Relieved, I press back into my seat, discreetly patting my pocket to reassure myself that the beat is still there. Before long, we're on Main Street, in the tiny little town of Danville. I look around without interest, barely noticing the old buildings that line the street. We park behind an old-fashioned black-and-white police car, bearing the restaurant's name, Mayberry Cafe on its side. Dad lets out a laugh and explains that this restaurant is a throwback to some television show from the 1960s that featured a goofy police officer. None of it really matters to me. All I know is that the bead is warm in my pocket as we climb out of the car and walk into the restaurant. Dad holds the door and breathes in deeply. Mmm, smells like fried chicken, he says, patting his stomach with a smile. The rest of the family remains quiet as we head up the stairs to our reserved room. I sit next to Evelyn, of course. Hey, she says, giving me a small smile. Hey, I respond, and stick my hand in my pocket to feel the bead, feeling guilty that I'm not in a rush to tell even her about it. I tell Evelyn everything, but I'm just not ready to talk about this. What would I say? How would I tell her? Would she think I'm crazy? Maybe it's just a coincidence, and I'm all worked up over nothing. Maybe somebody else had a bead with the letters KMR on it, and they lost it walking around in those woods. Right. Who am I trying to kid? I feel sorry for the waitress as she approaches, looking nervous. I guess our crew would make me sweat if I were a waitress. They're nearly 30 in our party with a bunch of kids, and most of us have red puffy eyes from crying. I order a Coke and bury my head in the menu, as if I might actually order something other than a cheeseburger and fries. Really, I just don't feel like talking, not even to Evelyn. The other kids around me have finished with their menus, and they all begin to talk amongst themselves. I wish that they would all just melt away and I could be alone. My discomfort makes the time drag by, and it seems like forever before the waitress brings the drinks and takes our orders. 
When she leaves, I look around at the familiar faces sitting near me. As usual, I'm stuck at one of the kids' tables. Evelyn's 18-year-old brother Dylan is sitting across from me, and their little sister Ava is to his right. My sister Gwen is next to Ava. They're both 13 and best friends like me and Evelyn. Aunt Mary Ellen's oldest, 14-year-old Thomas, is on Dylan's left, and his 12-year-old brother Isaac is next to him. Isaac idolizes Dylan, so he's straining around Thomas, hanging on to Dylan's every word. The two ten-year-olds, my brother Paul and Mary Ellen's fourth child, Daniel, are at the far end of the table, while Mary Ellen's youngest, Maria, is sitting on my right, busy coloring her paper placemat. All of the other kids seem to have recovered from the awkwardness of being at the crash site, and I'm the only one who's not involved in the conversation. I still feel a little shaky, ready to cry at the drop of a hat, and I'm afraid to say anything to Evelyn because I know she'll see right through me and ask what's going on. So I mumble something about drying my skirt in the bathroom, scrape back my chair, and head down the stairs, hoping for a little privacy. I find the bathroom, lock the door, and brace my hands on the edges of the sink, looking at myself in the mirror as if my reflection might hold some answers. What drew me to those trees? How did I find a tiny bead in the midst of that huge field when the investigators missed it? Is it just a coincidence that it's my bead? Or is it somehow more than that? Is Grandma trying to speak to me somehow? And if she is, what is she saying? The mirror holds no answers, so I turn to the hand dryer. It won't stay on unless I hold the button and I find myself pressing it down with my left hand behind my back while sticking my backside toward the dryer using my right hand to lift the skirt toward the airflow. Thank God it's a one-person bathroom, so there's no chance of someone walking in on me. Five minutes later, finally satisfied with the results, I wash my hands and splash some water on my face before heading out of the bathroom. The walk back to our room takes me through a small gift shop. Not ready to face the crowd upstairs, I pretend to browse the collection of t-shirts, coffee mugs, and knickknacks. I put my hand in my pocket to reassure myself that the bead is still there, then draw it out, rolling it pensively within my fingers. I walk to the window to seek the sun's light, where I use my fingernail to scrape the dirt from the engraved letter K. Absorbed in the bead, I don't even realize that someone else has come into the gift shop area until I hear a discreet cough. Looking up, I see a girl standing only a few feet away and hastily shove the bead back into my pocket. She watches me with interest and tucks an unruly strand of hair behind one ear. Can I help you? she asks, after a too long pause. The girl looks like she's about 18 with blonde hair that's pulled back into a messy ponytail. She wears the restaurant's uniform of black pants and a maroon shirt bearing the restaurant's logo. Um, no, I was just looking. Well, okay. Well, my name's Chelsea, if you need anything. She shrugs, starting to walk away, but then pauses to ask, You here with the big group upstairs? Yeah, that's my family. Her eyes get big. Wow, that's a big family. Do you guys get together like that often? Well, we used to. I mean, we do at Christmas and Thanksgiving and Easter and stuff, but... This. I swallow and blink my eyes, not wanting to cry in front of someone I don't even know. This is different. Oh, like someone's big birthday or something? A small, bitter laugh escapes me. No, not a birthday. My grandma was on that plane a year ago, the one that... The words catch in my throat. Chelsea's hand flies to her mouth. Her bright eyes widen and fill with pity. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. How awful. Yeah, well, it takes time, but you get over it. I lie with a shrug. She tries to change the subject. Uh, so... Do you live near here? 
about forty-five minutes away, in Indy. It's the first time that we've been out here. Well, that's cool. I mean, well, it's not, but... I decide to take pity on her. This is a nice store you've got here. I motion around me. Seriously? She rolls her eyes. Yeah, I guess, if you're into washed-up old television shows. She laughs, then looks around a bit nervously. Well, like I said, if you need anything, just ask. She starts to walk towards the counter, but then stops and turns around. Hey, can I ask you something? I guess so, I say, but I'm pretty sure I'm not going to want to answer. The thing you were looking at when I first came in, that you had in your hand, what was that? I put my fingers in my pocket and wrapped them around the bead which is warm from being tucked safely away in my pocket. Without even thinking about it, I pull the bead out and hold it in my palm for her to see. I don't understand why I would talk about it with this stranger, when I haven't even told Evelyn or my dad, but suddenly the words are tumbling from my lips. It's a rosary bead, you know, like from a rosary that old ladies pray with. My grandmother had a special one that my grandfather had made for her. It had a bead engraved with the initials of each of her children. Then, when they grew up and got married, she had beads made for their spouses. And when they had kids, she had beads made for their kids. So we each had our own bead, and it had our initials engraved on it. She said she prayed for us every day. Wow, she sounds like a really special grandmother. I pause and then say quietly, I found this out in the field today, during the memorial service. This is my bead. I continue to stare at the silver bead in my hand for a moment, then finally look up. Chelsea's face has gone white, and she stares at the bead too. I wouldn't have thought it possible, but those big brown eyes have gotten even wider than before. After what seems like forever, she shifts her gaze to mine. Her mouth is hanging open and her jaw moves, like she wants to say something, but she can't find the words. She reaches her hand out and grasps hold of the nearby counter, as if to prevent her legs from going out from under her. Finally, still looking straight into my eyes, she breathes. I found a bead just like that one, only it said E-M-L. I gave it to my best friend, Emma. She looks down at the bead in my pan. She looks down at the bead in my palm. Emma Marie Lowry. E-M-L. She. Her shocked eyes find mine again. She thinks it saved her life. 